Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Hello, everybody. Uh, I can see we're three, six people now, plus three, so we're nine. Welcome, um, welcome to this pre-event. My name is Lee Hibbard, and uh, I've been asked to uh, moderate this pre-event session, um, which is called Should Education 3.0 and Children Be Part of Internet Governance? And uh, if you haven't already got it, there's the... Um, there's the paper that, uh, well, there's a paper there I'd like you to take if you don't already have it, and the, uh, the flyer for this, this pre-event on this second table here. If you haven't got it, please come and take it because it's one of two papers which have just been re released very recently. Um, and and uh, this is why we have our two experts here on this, on this panel uh, who I'll introduce to you very shortly. Um, uh, to, to give you a little, little, little bit of a summary is that the, the, uh, there's, a, there's been a, 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 how do you put that? The Global Commission on Internet Governance is, a, I think, a two-year project which is, which is conducting research and analysis on internet governance issues. And um, John Carr and Divina Frameg separately have been preparing papers for the Global Commission on Internet Governance linked to children and education, human rights, um, and internet governance issues. And so they are going to talk about their respective papers, which they co-authored uh, with others. Um, so be before we get there, I just want to say a few words about why I think this session is, is important. Um, Internet Governance Forum starts this year today, and it will carry on for the rest of the week. Uh, Internet governance is something which is uh, being discussed uh, quite a lot now in New York, in the United Nations. Um, it's a time where there's a review process going on. It's, the, it's called the WSIS Plus 10. And they are uh, uh, evaluating you know, what internet governance dialogue means, why is it important, what, does it, uh, what can it achieve, etc. cetera. Um, and in that reflection, w one of the things which is coming through into the Internet Governance Forum is questions of access, access to the internet. And there'll be certainly sessions throughout this next few days on questions of access to the internet. That involves access to the internet for young people and children. And um, access is not just for developed countries, it's also for developing countries. And uh, very clearly what's happening is that, that people talk a lot about the next billion users coming online. Uh, that means uh, many users from uh, developing countries, and many of those users in those developing countries will be children and young people. So what does access mean? Access means what? Just physical access? Does it mean literacy? Does it mean, what does it mean exactly? What are we accessing exactly? And so. This session is going to look at uh, the rights of children at the very, at the very onset, uh, outset. Um, what does rights for children mean online? You know, what, what level of um, access, agency, uh, autonomy do they have in expressing themselves, in assembling and uh, associating, in, in expressing themselves, etc.? cetera? Um, are, they just, are they just a group of vulnerable individuals, children, uh, do we always see them as a group which needs to be protected or are they much more than that? Um, also looking forward in, in looking at an internet we want, uh, how you shape the internet, that's why we're here, how do you shape the internet? What role, is, what role do children have here? Are there many children attending the IGF this week? I, I would ask the question. How many will be active in debates? Um, do we know that? Do they have a, do they have a real voice in, in, this, in these discussions? Should they have a real voice in these discussions? That's the, really the question. And so um, I'm going to, uh, to, to the question of well-being and participation and also employment later in, li later in life after school, uh, that's also going to be discussed because, of, co of course, access to the Internet means access, hopefully, to opportunities, employability. Uh, but what skills, what, what competences do you need um, to... Um, to access the internet and to give, your ch give children the chance to become uh, young adults with employment prospects. So we're looking, also looking ahead. We're looking at literacy, we're looking at well-being, we're looking at the way that education is carried out now and how education can be carried out in the future with regard to internet governance in, in the mix of things. Um, I think we're going to be looking at questions of, you know, what's the role of education? Um, what's the role of children themselves and young people themselves? What can they do themselves? And what can internet governance do? What can this forum do, for example? Also, not just the global forum, but also the national forums and the regional forums, the ones that you know in different places. What can they do? What can they do together, actually? So the conflation between those different actors and pillars is very, is very interesting. Now, in the flyer that's on the table, so if you haven't got it, please take it. 
um, there are some recommendations for discussion. I'd ask you to think about those recommendations and, and of course, read the paper, uh, uh, the one of two papers, which, which I hope the other tech paper, John, can give you access to at some point soon. But this is the, this is the frame of the discussion. Um, and I'm first of all going to pass to John Carr, who is an expert advisor on, of, the, of the European NGO Alliance for Children Safety Online and to ECPAT International. And as I've mentioned, he's one of the, the co-authors of the new paper being released, or is released, uh, called One in Three, Internet Governance and Children's Rights. So please, John, take the floor. Thank you. Okay. That's it? Okay. Yep. <coughs> good morning. Was it bon dia? Bon dia. Bon dia. Okay. That's good. They're my first words of Brazilian ever. Um, so... As you've heard, I'm an uh, expert advisor. I'm here representing the European NGO Alliance for Child Safety Online, which is based in Rome, in Italy. Uh, but I'm also, as Lee mentioned, the uh, expert advisor to ECPAT International, which is a global uh, child rights, child protection organization based in Bangkok in, in Thailand. But of course, as you may have guessed from my accent, I am actually British uh, and live in London, where the weather is extremely cold and horrible at the moment. So it's an extra reason to be glad uh, about being uh, here. So Lee uh, has mentioned uh, that I am one of the co-authors of a document that was published uh, last week. Um, by the uh, Chatham House, which most people have heard of. It's uh, otherwise known as the Royal Institution for International Affairs, based in London, jointly with the Global Commission on Internet Safety, which is based in Canada. It's chaired by Carl Bildt, the former uh, Prime Minister of Sweden. Uh, and they've published our document, uh, One in Three Children Internet Governance, as I say, last week. And I apologize for the fact that there are no copies in the room uh, today. Uh, I think the, the copies are probably in a queue outside the building in the arms of the man who's supposed to be bringing them here. Um, and at some point during the week, if you keep your eyes open, uh, you might find one on, on one of the stands. Otherwise, you will find it online. Um, and I'll, I'm going to do a blog about it later this week uh, anyway. Um, and the other two authors, who deserve most of the credit, by the way, for the work that went into preparing this document, were Professor Sonia Livingston of the London School of Economics and Political Science uh, and Yasmina Byrne uh, from Innocenti, which, as you probably know, is the Global Research Centre for UNICEF. Uh, so the, it was the three of us who, 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 who published it. And um, I'll just say one very general thing uh, at the outset, um, I guess. Uh, I don't think we're very far from a moment in time when access to the internet will be declared to be a fundamental human right for children, if not for the population as a whole, because uh, it is impossible to imagine how in this day and age you can deliver a good education to children, unless those children get access to the internet. Um, in other words, a child today without access to the internet is a child at a disadvantage. And that disadvantage might be measured in, in relation to other children within their own country. They might be from poorer groups or more marginal elements in their, in their society or you could measure it internationally in comparison with children and young people in other countries or other regions of the world. But access without literacy is like giving a person half a horse, whereas what children need, what we all need, is the whole horse. So I, don't, I see access and literacy as going hand in hand, but also, and this is, I guess, uh, in a way, been my longer term interest, Access and literacy in an environment that is not as safe as it can be is not satisfactory or acceptable. And, you know, for many, many years, there's been what I consider to be a false polarity. We're asked to make a choice. Oh, no, no, forget about the, all that protection stuff, filters and all of these technical measures. Just educate children, make them aware of the dangers, equip them, empower them, and you can forget about all of the other stuff. Wrong. Uh, it's not either or, we need both. We need to make sure that at a technical level, as much as possible that can be done to keep 
illegal content away from kids or bad content away from kids is being done, but also given that we know that technical measures are never perfect, we also need to make sure that through media literacy, children are as empowered, as well equipped, as well educated as they can be to deal with this modern uh, phenomenon. So that's, I, I don't accept it's a choice between one or the other. People sometimes say the balance goes too far one way or, the, or it goes too far the other way. Well, I'm a very reasonable man. I like to get it right and go right in the middle. And, and I don't want to make a choice between literacy, access, and, and safety. The, the things need to, be, need to be hand in hand. Now, what's the, what's the main point of, of the paper that I've referred to? So in the, in the developed world, take the United Kingdom as an example, we know pretty much exactly how many children are going online. And by the way, we're using the legal definition of children here, which is the one defined in the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, which every country in the world except for the United States has signed up to. Uh, and that means to say we're talking about persons under the age of 18. Um, now that doesn't mean to say or imply that you regard everybody under the age of 18 as requiring or needing exactly the same sort of treatment or approach, absolutely not. Five-year-olds and 17-year-olds, very, very different creatures. But from a legal point of view, and you, this is reflected in the laws of every country that I know of, there are special rules which apply to people below the age of majority, okay? They're in a different category. Um, and, and, we, and we know, sorry to get back to my, my main thing, we know, uh, in all of the developed world, more or less exactly how many kids are going online. We know in Britain, for example, my own country, that it's just over one in five uh, of every internet user in the United Kingdom is a child. Just over one in five of everybody who goes online uh, from a UK-based uh, IP address will be under the age of uh, 18. Uh, some of these will be as young as three. 10% uh, of three and four-year-olds in Britain now are regular users of tablets. Not all of those tablets will be internet enabled, but they, they've all got the capacity to go online. 10% of three and four year olds have got their own tablets. So we know rough, just over one in five of every user in Britain is a child, a legal, a legal child. We know in Europe, by that I mean, sorry, the European Union area, that just less than one in five of every person on the internet uh, is under the age of 18. Um, just less than one in five. But what we've never known until our document came out this week is what the position is globally. And so this is the first time, uh, if you like, through research that anybody has sought to document um, the scale of usage by children, by legal minors, on a global basis. And the number that we've come up with, it's in the title of the document. Why is everybody looking behind me? Ah. Isn't it? No. Are they talking about Leeds United by any chance? No. <laughs> John, can I just, yeah, well, thank you. I, I didn't know that. Can I just ask the technical people, please, if we could um, either take that off or, 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 or put our own <laughs> transcript uh, on, please, so that we can, so it doesn't distract the people in the room. Thank you. John. So, yeah, so anecdotally, anecdotally, we have known for a very long time, obviously, that children are major users, legal minors are major users of the internet around the world. But nobody's actually, before this report, documented it or taking a research propose, uh, approach, tried to clarify exactly what the numbers are, what the scale of it is. And what, what our report shows uh, is that one in three of every internet user in the world is a legal minor. And in parts of the developing world, it rises to nearly one in two, okay? And by the way, you probably know the theme of this year's IGF is the next billion. It's all about a big push to connect the next billion people to the internet. Well, according to our estimates, therefore, 300 million of that next billion are going to be children, are going to be, uh, be legal, legal minors. Um, so that's, this is based on whatever available data sources we've, we've been able to, uh, to reach into. Um, and by the way, some other figures that you'll find in there which may be of interest, I think in Africa, for example, there are 20 million children um, who are internet users who are not, as it were, living within what you might call conventional family situations, okay? So when people say 
speak about the responsibility of parents to deal with children and the internet access, what's often overlooked is that there are very large numbers of children who don't have any, uh, or who don't live in conventional sort of family situations. In China, as I understand it, there are around 60 million children who are essentially living alone in rural areas because their parents have gone off to Shanghai or to Guangzhou, to big uh, industrial centers to live and so on. So uh, again, this, these are the sorts of issues that, that, that this report um, is raising. And I, I appreciate that you know, it's difficult sometimes to see whose responsibility it is to do what and so on and so forth, but what we're doing here is documenting why, uh, why you know, people's thoughts on this issue we don't think up to now have, have fully taken account or appreciated the position that children are in uh, uh, globally. And I'm afraid this is also true when you look at the, the way in which children have been treated within the world of internet governance. And I'm going to refer now to the Net Mundial statement. Uh, the Net Mundial statement adopted here in Brazil, was it last year? Uh, 2014, last year in Brazil. Now, I come from a group I mentioned at the beginning called INAXO, the European NGO Alliance for Child Safety Online. We have attended every single IGF except the first one in Athens in 2005. We missed that one. But we've been to every single one since then because we have a budget to go to the IGF once a year uh, to, to speak about these issues. We didn't go to Net Mundial because we didn't have the money. We didn't have the money to pay for the airfares to come to Brazil, much as I would love to have done, and take part in the Net Mundial conference. Uh, and when I looked at the list of participants at the Net Mundial Conference, there were only two organizations listed as, have, as having participated in the Net Mundial uh, event, which had any apparent connection to children's rights or children's issues. One was a youth club from Ghana, and one was, a, I think, a church group or an employment rights group for young people from, uh, um, I can't remember where, I think it was in... Thailand or someone like that. None of the children's groups that are normally come to the IGFs or normally go to these uh, events were present. And I imagine it was for the same reason that we weren't here at Net Mundial. We didn't have the money uh, to come. Now the Net Mundial statement has been referred to by many people as being one of the best summaries of thinking. I think Lee uh, at one point counted it was nearly 50 different charters, statements, declarations of internet rights, internet governance, what the agenda should be addressing. And the Net Mundial statement, I think, is, was widely acknowledged to be one of the best distillations and summaries of all of these different documents that people had worked on and produced over the years that internet governance has been an issue. And actually, when you read it, it looks fantastic. I mean, overall, it looks like a great document, no question about that. Here's the thing. Not once in that statement do any of the following three words appear. Child, child, children, or youth. Not once in the entire document. Child, children, youth, or for that matter, young, teen, tween. None of those words appear in the Net Mundial statement. And I think it's not unconnected to the fact that there were no children's groups in the room because we didn't have the money. But if you also look at that statement, what you will also notice is that the position of people with disabilities uh, in relation to internet access and internet rights gets mentioned three times, I think it is. It might be four, something like that. Now, I'm very pleased, by the way, extremely pleased that the special position and needs of people with disabilities are mentioned in the Net Mundial statement. And at a meeting uh, earlier this year in... Um, What's the capital of Bulgaria? Sophia. In Sofia, there was a Eurodig meeting and a guy called Marcus Kummer was present speaking about Net Mundial. And I asked Marcus Kummer, I said, Marcus, how can it be uh, that at the, in this Net Mundial statement, uh, children are not mentioned at all and the people with disabilities get mentioned three or four times? He said, in a room with lots of people, I think you were in the room as well, yeah. Lee. He said, well, because nobody mentioned them. Now, I can't believe nobody literally mentioned children, but if they did mention children, they didn't mention them sufficiently forcefully or persistently uh, or strongly to get them even a mention in the document. Um, and 
So they were kind of overlooked. Now, that's not because the people at Netmundial were bad people or didn't care about children or anything like that. Absolutely not. But people go to these meetings because they have their agenda. They have their interest to push and pursue. That's exactly right. That's why we're here now. Um, and that, there's nothing wrong with that. That's how these things have always worked. Uh, but it happens all the time. When you look around the internet, internet governance institutions, what you notice is an absence, at least consistently, of strong voices, strong representation of children. The MAG, for example, has never consistently had anybody uh, in membership who've had a children or children's rights as part of their, uh, their brief. They've had people from time to time and still have people who are interested and care, but nobody has been on the MAG specifically to represent a children's perspective. Um, and I think that's a, a very poor reflection on it. And when you go to some of these events, and I've, I've got to express myself carefully here because I don't want people to misunderstand what I'm about to say. You go to some of these meetings and you, there's a group of three or four kids get up on a platform, very well educated, obviously. They always speak in perfect English, perfectly well dressed, embarrassingly well dressed sometimes. Um, and you kind of wonder, I'm, I'm really glad that those kids get to fly around the world and get to come to conferences, but to call that children, listening to children's voices is an insult. It's tokenism of the worst kind. There are, to, to listen to children's voices and re reflect their point of view properly is expensive, it's time consuming, and if you're gonna do it, you need to do it right. Just paying for a few kids to fly around the world in suits and ties uh, to get up and say what, how groovy the internet is, is, is an insult to the idea of child participation, uh, and it's got to change. So uh, that's sort of where I'm coming from on all of this stuff, and I'm very sorry the document's not actually here, uh, but it will be here sometime during the week. I hope you'll read it, comment on it. You probably won't agree with everything in it, in fact, I'll be disappointed if you do, because it's meant to generate debate and discussion. And thank you for listening to me. Thank you, John. Thank you. John. Thank, you. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, for those who have just come into the room, there, are, there is a flyer and there, are, there is some information on this second row here. If you wish to take it, please, it's linked to this discussion, so come and take a copy. Um, and there is a stand for the Global Commission on Internet Governance, which is outside. So uh, we'll put these documents uh, yeah. there. I guess you can put the doc your document there, John, there. Yeah, yeah. and you'll, ha you'll be able to access it sometime soon. Now, without further ado, Divine Framegs, who is a professor from the Sorbonne Nouvelle Université in Paris. Um, and um, Divina and I have prepared a paper on Education 3.0 and Internet Governance, a new global alliance for children and young people's sustainable digital development. Uh, which is being published by the Global Commission on Internet Governance and will be out very soon. Um, Divina. Thank you, Lee. Um, thank you all for being here, and especially the young people I see, I see there. You're not tokens, I, I take it, I hope. Um, but I, I will piggyback on, on uh, John's um, uh, paper um, because um, we thought about these papers as twin papers. Uh, on the one hand, John and Sonia and Yasmina were uh, building more of a case for the human rights issue. Uh, we were building the case for the education issue, but in our paper we mentioned that human rights are part of education and, and internet governance. We came from the same... Um, 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 obvious observation that um, as well as children were not mentioned in uh, the IG uh, documents, uh, education wasn't either. So as if it was a blank uh, spot that nobody uh, was seeing. Uh, mostly I think it's a hypothesis we make in the paper because um, the uh, education is usually subsidiary, which is to say that each country claims that it can do it or it must do it for itself. And so just like taking care of children can be considered as subsidiary. But what we claim is that in sort of a transborder, transnational world of internet, uh, maintaining this uh, subsidiarity is in fact a way of avoiding the issue. And uh, the issue has to be embraced at an international level by, by uh, all, uh, all stakeholders. So this is one first point I think we can, we can share. Um, 
Then we also shared the idea that education and access were very closely linked and that in the uh, internet governance it was mostly a technical approach to access um, and infrastructure that was uh, taken. If you take the four major principles, um, uh, openness, that's about very much the technical aspect of uh, access. Um, interoperability, bah, same thing. Um, the idea of neutrality, again, it's all to the to the um, uh, protocol and the code dimension level of the uh, internet, not the social or the legal, uh, and not to mention the educational. So if we want to build access for what it's worth, which is to say sustainability, uh, for empowerment, for opportunity, not just threshold access, that means definitely putting education massively uh, associated with, uh, with access. So that was also one of our common, uh, common ideas, um, I think, about, uh, about this. Um, and then we, um, we wondered, you know, how to approach this complex issue, how to add education as one of the major principles, one of the core principles of um, internet governance as it is moving maybe hopefully to some kind of treaty, some kind of net mundial for all. How do we put uh, education in, uh, in the picture um, and empower young people that way, but also teachers and parents and adults who are uh, uh, important in the uh, are important multi stakeholders in uh, in this process. And so it's how to create a dialogue among all these people that we wanted to uh, reignite. And we were helped by the, the mention of one group of young people from Denmark who participated in Eurodig, and that that struck uh, Lee's imagination. He said, "These kids said we want governance in education." Ah, and that set me thinking too, and was saying, telling myself, well, we have to think about a holistic manner of explaining this. Um, there has to be governance in education. What does it mean if we put governance as a principle of education? What are the, the, the core issues? But and on the other hand, there is this huge global process, trans-border process called Internet Governance, Internet Governance Forum. How do we get these guys out there interested too. So our paper, if you read it, is going to seem to you complex, hopefully I hope challenging, uh, we hope challenging, because we wanted mostly to put this issue on the table. So um, the 10 recommendations that you find at the end uh, in one of, in the folder, you know, in the, uh, I'm just testing your literacy here on page three of the folder, um, are ways of preparing a roadmap for the future that we're submitting to you. And there are ways of uh, dealing and helping us deal one by one with um, education. I'm going to take them uh, with you, uh, if you haven't read the paper, uh, just so that you see um, what we meant. And there she goes quite rapidly. Um, basically, the recommendations one to six, one to six, are, are about governance in education. Okay, one to six is about governance in education. If we use this good term of governance that by now is getting some maturity, how does it work with education, even at the national level, or for whichever multi-stakeholder? And then the um, recommendations from seven to 10 are about internet governance and how it could deal with education. Okay, am I clear? Are we clear? So it's twofold. Of course, we claim that these tracks that are parallel should in fact meet, and that we have to make it work so that they, they mutually reinforce each other. But for the sake of clarity and for giving ideas and empowering people locally, we know you come here also to take ideas home, we, we separated the two. So the first six are about what would it look like, what is crucial to have to have good governance in education systems, and the other ones are about internet governance process per se, which is why Lee is the co-writer, because he is a specialist of internet governance, I am not, I'm a specialist of education, and so we brought together our two uh, expertise uh, that way. So we, um, we posit that um, the current debates for the transition to the digital, which are shaking and creating a crisis in schools, um, are wrong if they look only at coding, 
which is what has really been grabbing the attention of media and really preoccupying decision makers in education. We have to train them to code. They have to know about coding. What we realize as researchers is that coding for the sake of coding has already been started from the 80s, 90s, 2000s, and each time with very mixed results, not to say uh, with total um, uh, failures. And that coding without values, without the attitudes, without the um, knowledge, without the competences, mm -hmm. Um, is not going to lead us anywhere. I, I had a meeting with my, uh, I'm the director of CLEMI, I had Korean people from Southern Korea come to my, to my center saying, we have computers in every school in Korea, in every family, every child has a tablet. We need the meaning. We haven't found the meaning. And they said to me, the meaning is media and information literacy. Now, media and information literacy if you think of it as a, a pre-digital world uh, word, is a bit obsolete. It used to be about the press. It used to be about media, pre-digital media. Internet is a digital media. And media literacy has to be totally rebooted to include data literacy, news literacy, all these miscellaneous literacy that are not taught at school, but are, that's what we say, that are the new 21st century basics, basics, just as important as reading and writing. So this is one major, major point we want to, to push. Training to, to know, you know, be literate about your avatar. This is going to be crucial uh, for a child uh, in tomorrow's world where we, we say that play is going to be the new work. Okay, so these are very important things to, to carry as part of, uh, of governance. Um, also, impacting education is data in the forms of learning analytics that are following children and are double-edged because they can trace children in the bad way, in the sense of uh, being connected then to health, to poor re record at school, etc., etc., and, and losing uh, the, 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 the mastery over one's own data can be very problematic. On the other hand, we also know that learning analytics could help teachers figure out where children are lagging behind and make specific recommendations to help specific children, so it can have a positive impact. All of this we have to unpack and measure and follow up and make sure it doesn't go astray. Um, if we want this to happen, it means that um, children have to uh, be part of education, the education process also. If internet is about participatory education, children are one of the multi-stakeholder and they should be there and they should produce feedback and they should be in the co-construction of education. So it's important for us that uh, internet governance, its principles and pr its processes are also part of education. At the moment, they remain very much behind closed doors. Uh, recently, the net neutrality debates in Europe happened within a month. Nobody was consulted, uh, et cetera, et cetera. This is not possible. But if children and adults don't know it and don't act and protest it, it's going to happen behind the main major stakeholders back. I have only two minutes, he says. Um, anyways, so this is why we propose that uh, there should be a major uh, in investment in children as co-designers of education, and this will lead to the new jobs. Education is also about employability. Not employment, but employability. We know that at the moment there's seven million jobs in the digital um, economy that are not taken. It's enormous. Uh, and there's so much unemployment on the other side. So it does mean that there is a problem of gap between what is taught in schools and what the jobs outside are expecting. And so this, this work to school to work gap, we need to address in the governance of education. On the other hand, if I move now to the internet governance and education and what it can do, three things quickly. And you, you know that in internet governance, there's always three stakeholders. There's civil society, there's business, and there's the public service. Well, we think that public authorities have to collaborate to develop indicators and accountability mechanisms to make, make sure that education governance in the schools is happening. But we also think that um, the private sector, internet content and service providers have to support education 3.0 
as a public service, but with their support, the way it's always been done with education. They cannot, it is not their remit to educate, but they have to support education. One of the ways to go is maybe using their corporate social responsibility, and we have very good examples in the, in the document. And the last one is about uh, civil society. And the idea we have, and we share a thing with John, uh, is that children have to be part of civil society. They really have to become a constituency that is recognized as such, not as token, but really with representatives or with people that can take their voices and express them, not just through uh, the vision and the voice of adults. They really have to be trained uh, in order to be able to themselves um, use internet governance. And unfortunately, for financial reasons, because they also have um, so many requests otherwise, um, uh, the 15 to 18 year olds have to prepare for their different degrees, and so they're not that much free. But we have to invent creative ways of making them participate, be it by distance, streaming, whatever. Uh, we now have the technology, why not use it more? And the last point uh, that we have is sort of a joke or recommendation. Recommendation <laughs> number 10 is if we want it to work, we need to have some people able to shake it. The way uh, people like Franck Larue were able to uh, shake it about human rights by being special rapporteurs, and, and Franck is, is today in a meeting or else he would have been with us. And, but, so the idea would be to create the position of a special rapporteur for Education 3.0, just to shake it and move it regionally, because we know the issues are regional, each region has its own stakes, uh, but make sure that that dialogues happen more and more and more so that teachers and parents and young people can be really aware of all these issues and can take them. At the moment, uh, it is too much something that remains uh, the, the discussion, the dialogue of too, too many, too, too few people. So we have to open up, we have to democratize IG internet governance. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Divina. Um, uh, thank you to both of you. We have 10 minutes uh, left, and really it's a time for dialogue. We, we, we can always, of course, meet outside of this room and, and throughout this week, so we are here to, to t talk and, and go further. And, of course, the papers will be available very soon. Um, so I want to turn the tables to you um, to uh, see whether you have questions. And while you're thinking about those questions to, to colleagues here, um, I mean, what I take away is the fact that children are online alone. We talk about solo kids online. And there are studies which say how many hours they spend alone online. And they're not with their parents or with their teachers, of course. Whether that be a tablet or a phone or, 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 or a laptop, you can imagine. And, and the question is, is that if they're alone online, what are they doing? And what's their navigation? What's their compass? What are their skills, etc.? cetera? Um, and, and quite clearly, when you think about access in developing countries, when you think about where we are going, it's a great opportunity, but there are also, of course, certain risks. So, you know, where, where will children be in the future with regard to access to the internet? Um, will they have the skills they need? Um, are, will they be excluded? Will they be included? Uh, will, they, will they go along the career line, which is to say that we need values? Um, are, you know, what are those values? I mean, what's happening in Brazil? Do they have the values when they go online? Are they being taught in schools? Are they picking, up, picking them up from YouTube tutorials? I'm being provocative, of course. But um, I, I open the floor to you, uh, to your thoughts. Um, and so if you have any questions, please uh, raise your hands or come to the microphone, even. Any, don't be shy. What's your feeling? This is, a, this, is a, this is a conversation which happens, which touches everybody, many people. It's a very real conversation for teachers, parents, those working in the government, those working in industry. We're all pushing for access. We're all pushing for internet. It's all a great thing. But um, you know, what does that access really mean? You know, are we doing enough in schools? You know, are they getting the jobs that they need to get out of schools uh, to connect? You know, with have, to have well-being, to have a, have a life after school. Um, where does it lead us to? Or you know, are we? The question is, are we happy with the way that we see the internet, access to the internet, and schooling happening? Are we happy with the, with where it's going? Your views? Yes, please. Um, um, do we have a microphone or? It's not, it's not helpful for the streaming. Uh, you know, people are following on streaming, so I think you should talk in the microphone so that you're recorded. Um, thank you. I just have a very 
I don't know, a, a simple quick question. Uh, would education 3.0 include the adults? Because uh, what, why am I asking is that uh, I'm coming from Thailand and the country right now is quite divided. We have like uh, some chaos in the country and basically we have the right side and the left side and people are believing, grown, I mean grown-ups are believing things on the internet uh, and they on both sides, they both lie. And uh, what, uh, the, what is the problem here is that um, um, I think grown-ups, the adults, are as bad as children. I mean, um, so what I'm asking you is that uh, when you talk about education 3.0 and internet governance, um, I, are we including adults and you know media literacy for adults at all? Thank you. Um, okay, thank you. Davina, quickly, do you want to yes, respond to quickly, that? Yes, quickly, because, um, um, yes, media literacy uh, is uh, for, uh, for adults also, of course. Um, uh, what happens is that with um, Education 3.0 and the amount of participation of people earlier and earlier online, of young people, is that they tend to also train uh, adults um, and that there's possibility of um, intergenerational uh, uh, training here. And, and, and we're hoping that this is uh, what is happening. Yeah, but adults need it too because adults and young people at the moment, we are all entering uh, the internet pretty much without training. And we, we are hoping that the generation that was born on the internet, the so-called uh, natives, would be better trained, but it's not. It's operationally more or less uh, active, but in terms of values, attitudes, critical thinking, uh, citizenship, uh, they need to be totally retrained. And we notice that among our teachers. So yes, it's all part of that, which is why we keep the word media, because media alerts you to the fact that there is manipulation, that there is construction of an opinion, and that you have to be aware of it. It's not just about information, uh, the new data, uh, crunching, et cetera, et cetera. Media have to remain in it. A lot of the codes of the internet are media codes, and so we have to, I think, to keep uh, the two terms. Yeah, my name is Jutta Kroll. I'm from the German Center for Child Protection on the Internet. From the name of the organization, you might assume that I put protection first, but I really like the idea that protection and education are like communicating uh, columns or pillars where we build on. What I liked on your paper was the transition from education 2.0, which means ICTs are support tools for education, to 3.0, which is media and information literacy and internet governance as well. But what I would like to discuss is that, it, to my opinion, it must not be that we take the step of education 2.0 and then wait that we can go to the next stage of 3.0. I think in, in many areas we still have not achieved education 2.0 and it might be the right point to just skip it and move forward to 3.0 and not thinking that we need 1.0, 2.0 and 3.0. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Does anybody want, do you want to respond to that quickly? Yes? Or well, John? No? Well, <coughs> just say uh, in any uh, program that's got any kind of focus on child protection, parents, are and they're generally adults, not always necessary, but no, normally they will be adults, have to be part of the picture. And so to that extent, your point ought to be being picked up. Whether, whether this will mean that adults behave rationally, uh, whether it means adults will suddenly become more critical about what they read in the newspapers, Maybe they will continue to believe that Elvis Presley is alive and living on the dark side of the moon with Lee Harvey Oswald, who killed President Kennedy and all that kind of... I don't know. There's no, nothing we can do to guarantee Wasn't that. But, it, <laughs> but it certainly should be part, uh, a byproduct of a good child protection policy. Um, good morning. My name is Rodrigo. I'm from SaferNet Brazil. It's a Brazilian safer internet center. But also I'm here uh, working with uh, as a mentor of the youth group from Latin American Caribbean that we have some youth people here. 
Uh, and I don't know if you, everybody knows, but uh, this IGF, we have 72 youth people from Latin America and Caribbean, Caribbean countries uh, here uh, from yesterday to the whole week. And my question is just to ask, uh, uh, how do you visualize the strengthening this kind of youth participation at IGF? And maybe we are thinking about how engage these youth groups that are already working at IGF. We have the youth coalition, we have uh, the group from Asia, it's really strong, and another youth from Europe. But how do you visualize uh, including children in this kind of uh, internet governance forums and participations? Because it's really hard to, to really engage as a representative group, as John said, and maybe do you visualize uh, trying to make youth groups include the children's uh, early children to this discussion, maybe as a, a, a bridge between children and youth to bring all these issues to IGF and others. Forms. How, the question is how to really effectively engage children as the, the recommendation eight uh, supposed to, to do in the practicum uh, issues. Yeah. Some, of, some um, of the really, really sorry. good child participation projects that I've observed closely, and the, actually the Danish one is an extremely good example of it, they have been unbelievably expensive. Sorry, I didn't realize somebody was waiting to ask a question. I'll be very quick. They were very expensive, very time-consuming. They had extremely skilled animateurs working with the children, and they got some great results. Those, those Danish kids, they were very, very uh, impressive when they came to speak. There are, there are lots of, you know, and I work with children's organizations all the time. If, a children's, if children's organizations are not constantly talking to children, constantly in touch with children, they're not doing their job. They're not doing their job properly. But, you know, we have youth parliaments, we have youth councils in every country, well, certainly in Europe and many other countries, there are institutions where young people are coming together to express views and express opinions. But, you know, some of the things we talk about in internet governance, even I have difficulty staying awake uh, or understanding, understanding them. So, you know, we need to be more realistic about what we can expect people who are not as experienced. And why should they be? Uh, you know, you, and some of the issues are not... Do we? What do we need to know about child pornography on the internet and uh, fraud and phishing and things like this? I mean, there are some issues which we talk about that are completely inappropriate for certain types of very young audiences to engage with anyway. So we need to have a more realistic un understanding and engage with existing institutions, I think. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. I'm oh, sorry, Dina. I would just add, like, like to add, yes, there, are. there are institutions that exist where children can find the time to uh, mature their, their ideas, but what I think is, a, is an alarm system to adults that we don't have a culture of participation, a lot of us, even among ourselves as adults. So what, uh, what internet helps us is develop what I call a pedagogy for participation. We have to learn very early to speak in public, to ask questions, and they can be silly questions or very important questions. There's a very wonderful program in France called La Puce à l'Oreille, um, where seven-year-olds ask questions to scientists. And their questions are quite remarkable. They can upturn things. And so uh, we have programs also where uh, children and researchers work together, uh, asking themselves questions and trying to find solutions. So it's this, this pedagogy for participation that is key that is, for me, uh, the change agent. We have participation on the one hand. We have more and more educated people and adults on the other hand. Not enough, but if we don't develop together a pedagogy for participation, it won't work. And in, in many of our cultures, uh, the adults have the authority and they have a voice, full stop. I think, thank you, Divina. We've got two more, two more questions, and then we have someone on remote. So we, we really have only literally a few minutes left. Um, I'll, first, the lady there, please, and then, then you, please. Um, if you could be brief. Thank okay, you. my name is Kahme. 
and uh, apologizes because I late because of a uh, big line outside, and I was very interested in this uh, workshop, and I thought I was uh, I could find more teachers here because it's a very important uh, proposition, and uh, I, that guy told us I asked us about the participation of the youth in Internet 3.0. And my question is about the teachers, because my, our, our problem here in Brazil, and particularly in Nordeste, are the participation of the teachers, the old teachers, that makes a very, a very big resist in this work with the Internet at school and I work with it, and children are not the problem. They, they are the solutions. And so uh, you, you, oh, uh, you have just answered my question, and uh, I would like to uh, hear something more about participation of these uh, old teachers in internet and school. Okay. Um, can we take your last question with uh, the, qu the question of the lady here, please, when you, sp you say your name, and, um, and please, and then we have one last question on remote. Thank you. Okay. I'm Angelique Ali Hussain del Castillo, and um, first my compliments for, for, for the study. It, uh, it really is an eye-opener, especially the numbers, how many minors are online every day. My question has to do with... Um, who, who takes the lead in, in, in this? You know, um, you, it's, education is usually a, a government responsibility, mostly formal education. So who takes the lead, NGOs or the government, in, in, in providing this, this kind of mind shift with children, in, in involving the children? Because we know in the formal education system, it's often quite difficult to make changes in how things are approached. It takes a lot of money, which brings me to the next question I also have. Um, are there any examples of where this has already been done? I may, you just mentioned the Danish example, where it costs a lot of money. But for developing countries, it's usually money that's, that's, that's the biggest challenge. So is there any um, examples of developing countries who've already started on this and where they have been successful so we can take some, some lessons home? Um, I think that's what I'll leave it at. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Davina, you want to come in on that quickly? Because, or or yes. John, do you Quickly, uh, Quickly. Uh, and, and we can continue uh, outside. Yeah. Just before IGF, there has been a big uh, world summit on education innovation called WISE. WISE is about the private sector taking over education, with a lot of money coming from oil, from uh, com computing, and uh, where everybody is sort of waiting for the next big Apple or big Microsoft that is going to be the hegemon of education online, private. If we don't move on education 3.0 as a public service, using internet as a public value, as a critical public resource, education will be totally privatized. And it means that in developing countries in particular, poor parents are going to really bleed themselves to give education to, to their children when, in fact, we could have a much more open online uh, access to education that doesn't uh, throw away, of course, some of the contributions of the private sector, but should remain within the remit of um, the public service. But it's true that the public service at the moment is extremely resilient and resistant and uh, we have to make our decision makers realize that if they don't move, if they don't facilitate change or accept the change that is already there, because what we, we, I think we would say, all of us, is that we're already at Education 3.0. There's already excellent tutorials online, excellent courses online. Wikipedia just for itself could become a, a vibrant university if we wanted to. So it's already there 3.0 but not in the minds of our decision makers. If it doesn't happen, they'll be marginalized. Something else is going to happen that is going to be an online solution. And um, as a result, it's going to create more exclusion than inclusion when it has a potential of embarking everybody. 
So that's, that's what I would say. Thank you, Davina, and thank you to the speakers. One last question, and we are over time, but I'm not looking for inspiration. I'm looking at the question in front of me up there, which I think John will answer. Yeah. It's a question from Shalini from India. How do you allow participation in order not to infringe them as a group, meaning, I, may, I imagine, children, while also ensuring protection of children on the internet in situations when one cannot depend on parents or such traditional family structures? John. Yeah. Hello, Shalini, if you're still there. Uh, this is an excellent question, and it illustrates an argument that I've been engaged with for years. And in essence, there is a school of thought which has been saying, sometimes fairly explicitly, look, if kids' parents can't look after them and keep them safe, nobody else can, and it's just kind of like too bad. Uh, so we have to just re always, always put the emphasis on parents. That is not acceptable. We don't accept that argument in any other area of, of life. We don't say, well, you know, if your parents don't stop you going into a pub to drink alcohol, you can drink alcohol. If your parents don't stop you buying a gun, you can buy a gun. No. Equally, it should be true in the internet as well. There are certain things like exposure to child pornography or child abuse images, exposure to violent pornography, buying guns, buying alcohol, tobacco, things of this kind, which are, can be solved fundamentally in, in technical ways. And I think we have to look to the industry. And by the way, most of the industry wants to do this. There isn't an, an issue of principle here. They want to do it because we have a responsibility, whatever parents might be doing, to do what we can to keep them as safe as possible in the online space. That, that really concludes our time. We're over time. Thank you for coming. Thank you for, thank you for your questions, your comments. Uh, we're here all week, or most of us anyway, so grab us, talk to us, uh, and we'll get you the information you need. I think this is probably one of the best sessions that you'll probably be in the whole week, so keep it in your mind. Thank you. <laughs> Bye.